Today we are discussing about what is happening in the global energy uh, landscape. Of course, we live in an extremely volatile energy market with uh, soaring energy prices that hit both customers and businesses. And I am glad today that I will welcome Niels Roque, Executive Vice President of Sustainability at Sintef, to discuss what is happening right now in the energy sector. Niels, how are you? I'm good, and thank you. Thank you for joining Energy Live News. Pleasure. So I would like to start with what is happening right now regarding the sanctions that, you know, all governments announce every day sanctions against uh, Russian energy. Last week we saw Europe announced a ban on Russian oil by end of the year, of this year. I'm just wondering whether countries can easily cut ties with Russian oil and gas. And on the other side, how possible is for all their uh, sustainability efforts to keep their pace, you know? and accelerate. Mm. Yeah, um, those are very pertinent questions, I think. But um, gas and oil are quite different. They pose different uh, issues. And uh, if you look to Russian gas, I mean, that's uh, 45% of uh, EU imports of gas is from Russia and about 40% of the consumption. I mean, and this is mostly by pipeline. I mean, the difference between the 45 and the 40 is the domestic production in, in, in Europe. Uh, but this is mostly by pipeline, so it's not easy to divert any anywhere else. And um, this this gas goes to space heating, goes to power generation and industry, which is about one third of each. So it's quite critical um, to look at the whole season and how this uh, for space heating and power generation, how this um, uh, moves on uh, when we move into the cold season again. And uh, well, you could say we could uh, try to replace um, that import by other means, but then you're talking about liquefied natural gas. And if we look at the 40% of the EU gas consumption, if we're going to replace that by liquefied natural uh, gas, that is about 40% of the global LNG market. Uh, which is already very tight due to the high Asian demand because of the economic rebound. Uh, we also know that that may change somewhat, but still it's a, it's a high portion of what is available at the global scale. So the replacement um, will take some time. I mean, the Repower EU is saying that we, we should try to replace two thirds of the gas by end of year. It is ambitious objective, but um, it's a bit questionable in terms of feasibility, I think, and we need also to look into what other uh, factors we can can uh, chime in here to make this uh, opportunity. And and this is um, the better management of the gas storage. I mean, um, uh, you have gas storage, which um, uh, was not uh, filled to the required amount uh, for the winter we've just been through. We also need to complete the EU pipeline infrastructure to connect LNG, so liquefied natural gas, input to all countries. I mean, usually the gas comes from east and goes to the west, and it goes progressively in smaller and smaller pipelines. And if you're going to then to have the, the gas flowing from, from the sea, so to speak, from west to, to east, you can see that there will be um, uh, some shortages of capacity. And for instance, Germany has no LNG port in itself, so it has to, to also be built. And uh, uh, because of the structural imbalance, I think, between supply and demand, um, we, we expect to see quite high uh, gas prices and energy pr uh, prices for the, uh, you know, for, the, for the time in front of his, us because of the tensions on, on prices and also the um the situation between the the po in the politics when it comes to well basically a funding part of the war in in towards ukraine if you look to oil so i think i think you know gas these are usually landlocked kind of systems they are in pipelines to europe so uh, tricky to replace but we we have some some uh, elements we can put into that uh, when it comes to oil, I think it's uh, in, in principle much easier to replace because this is a global market and provided mostly by super tankers, although there are pipelines, of course. We have some areas in in EU which are totally landlocked and hard connected to Russian oil pipes. For instance, there are in what used to be East Germany, there are some pipelines going there with oil 
and the same goes with uh, Hungary and Slovakia. So um, that is a more feasible thing to do, but it will take a few months to re reorganize these supply chains and contracts in my in my view. You already said that probably it will take some time before we see, you know, the energy prices uh, returning in uh, their normal levels. Of course, what is happening in Ukraine, the war uh, in the Ukraine has created a domino effect in the uh, energy sector. We see the worst impact on energy prices, on energy suppliers that they are forced to exit because of uh, the gas prices. Do you feel that this energy crisis, do you think that, do you believe that it could last for years? Uh, yes, most certainly. First of all, <laughs> I mean, it's very, very hard to predict what are the prices on fossil fuels. I mean, the, if you look to the International Energy Agency, they have historically also been enabled to do this in a consistent way. But we, I think we have a, uh, a long area of, of uh, high energy prices, which will be well driven by this, this crisis we have today on supply. I mean, Energy is something that is very high on the demand scale for for people. It's almost be here, uh, hardly behind the food, you know. So, I think it's very unlikely it will get to levels we knew until a, a, a year ago. And um, we don't know how long this war will go on, but it's unlikely to finish soon. And I think the repercussions of that will last for quite uh, quite a time to see this roll back to anything similar. Um, I think this will take uh, time. But of course, uh, this is the golden moment for EU to uh, deploy, to, to research, innovate and deploy renewable energy technologies. And um, I mean, usually it was driven by the need to cut emissions and to go into this fit, fit for 55, so 55 percent reduction by 2030 and, and to become climate neutral by the 2050. That is a strong driver, of course, the, the crisis, the global warming crisis. But when you add the war to that and the energy demand and energy crisis, it just gives a higher momentum. So this will most definitely mean that we will have a much stronger focus on deployment of low carbon technologies. And um, um, that could that is the kind of solution to this. So w when will that come uh, on stream and, and uh, what what price? And then there is the issue, of course, that not all I mean, renewable uh, electricity cannot be used for for all purposes. For some purposes, you, you really need gas and, and oil. Uh, and just to add the last thing here is really what we see on the energy prices causes some concern about energy poverty uh, as energy prices are increasing. I think the energy uh, poverty was about 7% in the EU before the energy crisis. And when energy prices increases, you will get the increase of this. We already seen this and that is a risk for EU social stability. I mean, we all recall the, the yellow wests. So to have some short term fixes to have new oil and gas infrastructures will be needed. But I think it's very important that that is seen also together with the more longer term objectives, which could in some kind of bizarre way be supported by these events in in Ukraine, by the momentum behind clean energy technologies. I will come to my previous question. I know uh, and I remember that uh, you already mentioned that it is really difficult to predict how long this situation, this energy crisis uh, will uh, last. But I'm not really sure if you have checked uh, recent reports that they estimate that probably this crisis could last uh, by the end of 2023. Is it something that you agree with that? The supply situation or the crisis it itself? The energy crisis with the energy prices. Well, I, I think there will be... Uh... Uh, ramifications of this crisis for a long time and to be able to balance and to diversify. I think um, we will see uh, higher energy prices. In my view, I think that will last a bit longer than 2023. But um, I don't have my personal crystal ball, so to speak, to talk to. But um, yes. I think there will be a, a need and there will also be you know, if you take away such a large part of the energy supply to Europe, it, it will take some time to, to achieve a balance again. What additional measures do you think that are needed by governments to keep their energy security on the one hand and make a smoother energy transition on the other? So what is already happening, I think, you, I mean, the need to invest more into research and innovation and deployment 
of uh, renewable energies um, is crucially uh, important. Also, that we look into, as I said, what are the other sources of energy that we can get to Europe from um, states which are uh, perceived as more, well, uh, what should we say, more towards the, the Western democracies uh, thinking. And I also see that from Poland and Bulgaria, they have uh, decided uh, to exit contracts in December. And I see Poland are making links with uh, Norway for gas uh, distribution. And I also see Lithuania, Bulgaria looking into linking up with Greece and the pipeline from Azerbaijan through Turkey. So, I mean, th there are some um, um, parameters we can tweak here. And not to forget, there also need to be some change in the uh, behavior uh, patterns, like people turning down the thermostat by maybe one degree could save a lot of energy. And the same uh, during the, with the air conditioning. I, I, again, you know, I, I think uh, in a bizarre way, we can have a benefit out of this to get the momentum behind the clean energy transition. Uh, this actually was uh, my last question for you, uh, but actually uh, you actually partly answered. If you feel that a recent energy crisis could accelerate the pace of the energy uh, transition and, you know, the adoption of sustainability from people, from businesses. Yeah, um, I think that is um, that is key here to look into uh, the opportunities um, here in, in this situation. Um, but we also see that uh, there are disruptions in the markets. I mean, you have uh, distributors who sold fixed price contracts on energy, which are uh, going bankrupt. And we see state intervention to ensure continuity of such service to consumers. And also see that some of the member states are thinking about uh, imposing taxes on windfall profits on the specific situation which has um, uh, arrived. So I think uh, that we will see a significant shakeout of the energy sector uh, in the years to come. Neil, thank you very, very much for your time. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Same.